I'm talking 22 all the way back. Uh, we spend an awful lot on on leaders and and people. I, I I think leaders, your revenue will grow by your leaders, right? By your by your people. They'll they'll pull up revenue. Whereas most people think of them as uh, employees as an expense. Not if you put the right people on the bus. They'll pull your revenue. And so whenever there's a problem, we know it's that. And so we pour into it training wise. Welcome millionaires and future millionaires. You're listening to the Millionaires Unveiled podcast, the show where you'll hear the stories and interviews of everyday millionaires. We'll unveil their decisions, their strategies, and their portfolio allocation. Now to your host, Jace Mattinson. Welcome back to another episode of the Millionaires Unveiled podcast. This is episode number 352. Stace, it was basically a holiday today. That's why this is a little day, a day late. We witnessed quite the remarkable eclipse. Yeah, the eclipse was amazing today. We were in the path of totality here in Austin and had a lot of people uh, come into town for it. Schools were shut down, businesses, people were working from home. So it was uh, quite the sight to see. And happy belated birthday, Jace. It was your birthday yesterday. You're now an old man. <laughs> yeah, one year older, wiser. So, uh, yeah, it's great, great. Uh, and that's why this is a day late, because I felt like Monday was a holiday. And it was a national championship game. So that's why this is getting released on Tuesday, for those wondering. Thought I'd start out with a review this week. Uh, this one comes from Colonel Roosevelt, five star, great show, room for improvement. Been listening to the show for years and really enjoy it. With that said, the show seems to have gone through some changes recently, good and bad. On the positive side, Jace's wife, Stacy has been a great add to the show. Their interest and their overall dynamic together is great to listen to. On the negative side, the level of detail and questions for the guests seems to have taken a step backwards. I enjoy understanding the details of the guests' true net worth, not a wide-range estimate. Their financial allocations, details about their career, age, salary, etc. Well, the general format of the sto- uh, show has stayed the same feels like we find out less and less detail about the guest. Everything is more high level and has gone from millionaires unveiled versus millionaires partially unveiled. I know there's been some other recent negative reviews. Hopefully this review is not seen as hate. I'm a huge fan and love listening. Just would like to see the level of questions return to where they once were. Still giving it five stars. It remains one of my favorite podcasts to listen to. Colonel Roosevelt, thank you for that. And with that, I think based on some other emails we've received too, I thought I'd just go into a little bit of kind of the process of, you know, of the 300 plus guests that have come on the show and what we've done. Uh, Once again, they're all volunteer. So, you know, typically one of them uh, I either know or has basically written into the show as we take volunteers. And if you'd like to be on the show, send us an email, millionairesunveiled at gmail.com. At that point, there's, you know, we book a a time and there's an intake form where quite a bit of information is filled out, but not information that, uh, you know, effectively is audited uh, by myself or anybody. And then we do the interview. And the interview is very unscripted. I mean, we do have a little bit of dialogue before we record, and in some cases, a little dialogue after. And the information that basically is published is what the guest is willing to share. And in some cases, yeah, there's they ask for things to be edited out or ask to not share certain information or in some cases, even an exact net worth, you know, and I've, I've allowed them to come on the show, at least if they're willing to declare that they're a millionaire or one plus, And that may, in some cases I get that may bother some of you. Um, you know, especially if they're, you know, 10 or 20 or 15 or whatever. The other thing is there's probably, I would say, I don't know, probably about 70% now that, do not have it dialed in by, you know, 3.1 or 4.2 or, you know, they're guesstimating. And even when we do it at 4.2 or something, it's a little bit of a guesstimate. Sometimes, you know, uh, real estate's hard to value that they have in their portfolio or a business is hard to value or investments that are outside of, you know, marketable securities that you can mark uh, on a daily, weekly basis. And so that hopefully that gives a little background, uh, you know, to our guests uh, or about our guests, uh, rather, and, and to our listeners on kind of how this process works. And the other thing about the income, you know, I we, we used to ask some of that, but the, the reality was, and it still is, and in some cases I do ask it here and there, or sometimes guest divulges that uh, incomes can vary so widely depending on if you're, you know, talking about like what's your gross salary. If somebody's in a W-2, 
that might be a little bit easier to discuss. However, if they get a bonus that's based on certain things, if they get <clears throat> stock options or if they have investments in you know, passive investments in real estate or other businesses or something, it gets really hard. So you say a range of income and, you know, somebody may be worth, you know, 3 million, let's just say, for example, and they could have made anywhere between, you know, 200 and a million dollars. It just, you know, and then if you get into, well, what's the AGI or what's the taxable? It just, it started creating kind of some issues. I started getting honestly more emails, but like, how's this guy doing this? Or how's that lady doing this with that income or, this, that, and the other thing. And so in some cases, we've had a lot of guests that have not wanted to share that as well uh, as part of the show. And so I've, you know, felt like that was appropriate to honor that request, given that the the real crux I felt was, hey, you got to come on to, you know, you got to be a millionaire, you got to declare you're a millionaire. Uh, and maybe I've allowed more of those that are one pluses than, than maybe I should have. But at the same time, I, you know, I want to talk to millionaires. And if they don't want to divulge to their worth 10, or worth six, then, and they want to say one, then I've been okay for that to, to allow that. Uh, and then same thing on the, the, the income, you know, so hopefully that gives everybody a little bit more context. Uh, you know, Colonel appreciate the, the, the review. I'll try to get some more detailed questions around some things that uh, may provide some more context into what they do and how they do it. Uh, but as always, I'm open to, to, uh, questions from y'all if you want to ask in fact we do have a, a thing on our website with speakpipe where you can actually voice in the question and we'll play that recording to a guest and let them answer so it's directly from you to them not with us changing anything and uh in fact i got one of those recently in an email it says uh, this is from a shot he says i wonder what percentage of millionaires have become millionaires from just working hard alone Said, I realize I may be a horrible investor since I always invest in something right when everything crashes. Once I had enough cash shaved up, I had invested in two apartment deals passively with an award-winning syndicator that I have heard uh, being praised for many years. I finally took the risk and then found out they took a variable interest rate loans right before the rate hikes. So the apartments have gained no value for the last four years. I figured that he was so smart that he would lock in the low interest rate uh, mortgages at the bottom. I never even considered that he would be so dumb to do so given his praise. Even though I had negative return in all my investments in life, I still have a million dollars just from working hard and starting at zero with not a single penny from my parents or friends. Rashad, I would probably say that nearly all of our millionaires, in my opinion, would probably fit into the category of of working hard. Um, you know, I think most of them would agree with that. We've had a couple that have inherited uh, some of their wealth or a portion of it, but a large majority, I think back to like, think of one episode in the early days where they had inherited a majority of it. And then a few cents that have, or, you know, they were already millionaires and then they inherited some, but good old fashioned hard work for most those that have come on this podcast, uh, has been a recipe for success. Now we can discuss, uh, you know, varying levels of success with investments, but I would say nearly everybody has taken an L uh, from an investment standpoint at some point in their journey. In fact, you're going to hear about that on today's episode with today's guest. Uh, you know, he, he's quite the seasoned investor. We've had many requests for some, some, uh, guests that are, uh, quote unquote seasoned. He's in his late fifties. I think he said 57 to be exact. So you'll be able to hear from, from him. His name is Chris and currently his net worth sits at about 15 plus million and it is all in real estate. Uh, he's got a few, uh, small things in cash and, and a few other investment vehicles inside of his businesses and whatnot. But a large majority of it, you know, give it 90 plus percent is effectively in real estate or real estate related businesses. And recently he actually paid off his house too. Uh, but he had a big L and he went through 08 and uh, basically took him four years to effectively dig out of that hole. So I would say that most of them have had similar experience to you. Uh, where maybe they made an investment and either it didn't make money or significant money or the return wasn't what they thought it was going to be at some point or invested at crypto at the wrong time or I don't know, lost money on a house flip or I, you know, there's a myriad of cases. Uh, you know, I think back and sometimes it's opportunity cost too, right? Like I look back at our own situation and I missed out on some stuff that I didn't do. I don't know that I lost money per se, but by not doing something, I lost money. Um, by not taking quote unquote some risk. So 
I would say most of them. Stace, would you agree? Absolutely. And I think that uh, we have so many listeners who have written in to uh, to be interviewed and, and to share their stories that uh, I'm thinking of several that, that we've done that haven't been published recently, but they've said, you know, I just wanted to share that it doesn't have to be rocket science and that you can just, you know, you can just stay in a job and save money. And, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be sexy or uh, anything ridiculously noteworthy or risky in order to become a millionaire. And you can do it just like anybody else could. So uh, for sure, we have had several guests who, you know, have really, really high net worths. I mean, obviously, even just being millionaires is, is, is something to write home about, but, you know, 10 plus million or whatnot. Um, but really, I mean, the story of all of them is is working hard with the exception of the ones who have inherited some, but everyone's working hard. How, however, they're spending their time to make their money. Some are making more money per hour than others, of course. And, uh, you know, real estate's obviously a huge play that can that can swing the pendulum on on net worth um, quite significantly. But, um, you know, it doesn't have to be, uh, it doesn't have to be some crazy story. You can just stay in your career and work hard and save and, you know, invest mindfully. Um, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be crazy risky or, or uh, it doesn't have to be crazy risky in order to, uh, to make the million dollar status. Awesome. Without any further delay, let's get into this week's episode with Chris. Chris, do you want to just give us a little about your background and what you're up to now? Yeah, sure. I'll give, uh, I'm 33 years in the business, Jay, so I'm going to give you the high points and not put everybody to sleep. Um, so I, I've been at this game since 91. I'll, I'll age myself there a bit. And that has spanned uh, the gamut of raise the roof projects, condominium conversions, new construction, you name it. Uh, after the crash of 08, um, we did pivot big time uh, after getting beat up. And that was making sure we literally don't use uh, personal guarantees and bank loans uh, on any deal. We buy everything through creative real estate, which right now is sort of a hot button. So uh, that was all the impetus from the 2008 crash. And I say we, sorry, it's a family company. Um, we buy and sell our own properties the way we teach. And then we uh, end up teaching that all across North America, mostly United States. Wow. So we got 30 plus years of experience here. I'm excited about this one. So before we do though, what's your net worth today? Um, I'm going to, I'm going to be very general and say, uh, about 15 or so million. Okay. And what is the kind of the breakup of that? Is it all in real estate at this point or do you have other assets as well? No, I'm going to, uh, almost three quarters is in privately held entities and, and in those entities, uh, yes, there's some real estate. Um, and then the, the balance is all real estate, single, you know, single one-off real estate deals. Wow. So let's back up here and go through this journey a little bit. You said you started in the early 90s. Did you start with the single family home that most people start with or kind of walk us through that initial journey there? I actually built back then. So we did something that I was in my 20s and uh, mid 20s. And, and as I look back now, I say, well, that was kind of naive, but it worked because I didn't know enough to not ask. And that, here's what we asked for. We went around, we found vacant land, like one off lots. And I asked the owners to put a sign up that said, to be built package, new construction. Then I hooked up with a builder and then we went to all the vendors, lumber, everyone. And we said, hey, we're going to market this package, but nobody's going to get paid till the house is built. And then it gets financed at the end by the end buyer. And everybody said yes, because of the market we were in. Um, uh, that'd be a tough ask right now. It worked. And we sold probably over the next few years, we built and sold 100 homes or so. Um, that was my start. Um, so that was mostly singles, uh, some some multis in the in the building space. That was till about 95. We did it for about five years. Wow. So you weren't really the GC on these. You were just kind of the, the deal guy putting everything together, getting all the subs to agree to this. And then effectively, everybody makes their money when we when we get the things sold and financed. Is that correct? Well, we were the yeah yes and no because we were the company that that built it. But my partner was sort of the field guy, and I was the the office guy, if you will. You know, uh, running the numbers and 
running things internally. And then we built a little team around that. So we did do, we actually did GC the building, but it was him, not not me. You don't want me with a hammer, but but he ran that side. Interesting. And you said you were in your 20s before that post high school. Did you go to college at all? I did go to college, uh, but during college, I, I grew up in a welding supply business, not even real estate. But my dad, I'm talking from age like far back as I can remember, seven years old, maybe working there. But my dad would build buildings brick and mortar buildings and lease them back to his company. And that's where I kind of was around it. And then he would dabble on the side with real estate. So I was always into real estate. Yes, I went to college for business, but I was always trying to dabble and read and know what the hell's going on in real estate. Stace, name some business partners that have really got it done. Procter & Gamble. Ben & Jerry. Supply and Demand. Salt and Pepper. Peanut Butter & Jelly. What about the perfect partners when it comes to growing your business? That's Shopify. That's right. That's you and Shopify. Shopify is the global e-commerce. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real life store stage, all the way to did we just hit a million order stage? Shopify's there to help you grow. Whether you're selling shipping supplies or promoting productivity programs, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. From their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system, wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout up to 36% better compared to the leading commerce platforms. And sell more with less, thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. What I love about Shopify is... No matter how big you want to grow, Shopify gives you everything you need to take control and take your business to the next level. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the United States. And Shopify is glo- the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, Brooklyn, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash unveiled, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash unveiled. Now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in, that's shopify.com slash unveiled. And thanks again to Shopify for supporting today's episode. So you graduate from college at early 20s, and then you've got a three, five year gap before you started getting really heavy into this kind of development deal. Is that correct? Yeah, college was 88. That was 91. So about three years um, uh, of actually you know, breaking out on my own, I think around beginning of that. So maybe like 89, 90, I started looking into things, contacts, you know, hmm. how's this work? How's this go? And then 91 started popping it. Yeah. Interesting. Do you think, you know, college is a hot topic right now. And I'm just curious, given kind of your path. And I had a guest that I just yeah. interviewed as well that finished all but his last two courses and then, you know, has had a successful business. And I'm just curious in this day and age, from your standpoint, you know, how do you think about college? How do you think about you know, your kids and in college and whatnot and the value proposition or not that's there. Yeah. Okay. I do have a pretty strong opinion on this after all these years. Um, so I have two kids. Um, they're like 33 and 34 now, but Nick, my son did not go to college. He works in the family business with me and my daughter did go to college because at the time she thought she wanted pre-vet and that's kind of like, okay, that's a specialty. So you go for that, right? Nick had a snowboard injury when he was young, had a head injury, wasn't supposed to walk or talk again. He's doing awesome. But at the time he said, Hey dad, I don't want to go to college. I just want to work with you. I said, okay. So I created a, uh, so I think actions speak louder than words, right? This is a long answer to what we did. I created sort of a curriculum, if you will. And I remember my wife saying to my son, you sure you want to do this? Because it's not going to be easy. So I sent him through Dan Kennedy. I sent him through every mentor I had met or was with then. And, and he did seminars, financial, mindset, real estate, everything. And then he came in the family company. I, so that I would tell you that I would do that again. Interesting. I think that's so more valuable. He, he went through that. I guess how long did that take to go through all that, that you kind of put him through kind of that self-education piece? It's This is a good question. It's never ending, but pointedly doing that stuff was a couple of years. Okay. Interesting. And then do you still have ongoing stuff that you kind of facilitate through your company for him or yourself or both or? Everyone. Yeah, both. So wow. and even the employees. So we have what's called, uh, we run on a system with a sort of meeting rhythm. And one of the things we do is we have a, every trimester, we do a PDF for each of us. And on the PDF is what we call our big three, sort of what we own operationally for the business. At the bottom of that though, we added 
our, our mentor didn't give it to us. We added specialty training, personal. And so somebody might have on their mindset, somebody might not have on their financial, somebody might have on their particular niche in real estate. Like some, you got to be working on something this trimester. So that's always a piece of it. And is that something that you particularly, as the leader of your company, are you holding people accountable to that? Or is that just for them to kind of take care of on their own? You just want them to have that at the forefront of their mind. No, no, no. We do it. We, we do it. Like this year was the lightest year in a while. We realized that for, for us spending money on training, but we spent a lot uh, prior to this year. We spent a lot. So we're getting back to it again. But I'm talking 22 all the way back. Uh, we spent an awful lot on on leaders and and people. I, I I think leaders, your revenue will grow by your leaders, right? By your by your people. They'll they'll pull up revenue. Whereas most people think of them as uh, employees as an expense. Not if you put the right people on the bus. They'll pull your revenue. And so whenever there's a problem, we know it's that. And so we pour into it training wise. When do you think you started? Uh, kind of realizing that training was a, a key piece of this whole thing. Well, uh, so for some context, I was a solopreneur for years, uh, always like just by myself or a person or two, right? I never thought of, okay, I'll grow a company or I'll scale a company. In 17, I met elite entrepreneurs, Brett Gilliland. He, he's the CEO and founder. They help companies go from seven, eight figures basically. And they, so you got to be at kind of like the million mark as a company or entrepreneur, and then they'll take you to the next level. So he's the one that got us into, I, I give them credit for almost everything I'm telling you right now. It's not a system I designed, right? I just follow it. And he scaled us from that to we've been on Inc. 5000 in the last three years in a row for the fastest growing companies. But when he did the plan with me in 17, I thought to myself, honestly, you know, imposter syndrome, I'm thinking, I, I don't know about that. Like, that, I don't know if we're going to get, and I just followed along. And, and my son-in-law has done a great job of taking over that and scaling the company. He likes that piece. I like doing deals. So it's a nice balance. That's awesome. No, I, I hear you on that. I think it's, it's one of those things that uh, I feel like the most successful entrepreneurs, unless you, you know, are literally like Elon Musk and can design and do things that just nobody else can. It's just a, it's, it's a nice game of, you know, R and D rip off and design, apply to what you're doing, how you're doing it, make a few yeah. tweaks and then boom, you're off to the races. It sounds like that's yeah. what you've done with this system. Yeah, for sure. That's cool. So as you started scaling up, you said you were a solopreneur for, for quite a few years. Walk us kind of through those journeys. I mean, you're still doing one-off deals here and there. You did the development stuff and then kind of pivoted or did you ever start raising money? Kind of walk us through kind of your story of that middle time. Yeah, um, I did some money raising pre, uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting some serious sunlight here at the time of day. I, I did some serious um, investors pre-crash, pre-08. I didn't love it. Uh, coming out of the crash and the, and the pain that caused. So we don't anymore. We do no syndication. It's not that it's not good. It's not good for us. We do everything without banks and without gobs of cash. Like when we do a deal, and yes, I still do deals, um, we do it with little to no money. I So again, context on the week. My son and I and a small team still buy and sell around New England, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut. And then the, the company, the coaching company does deals with students. We don't just sell something and say, good luck. We do deals in the trenches with them. So we're always doing deals. It's a matter of if it's our portfolio or for a student. But during that period of kind of the 90s and early 2000s, you did kind of explore a lot of the other avenues that I guess people do in real estate at that point and decided oh, it wasn't it. for you. Yeah. Okay. So there was, I'll try to go in order, the building that we talked about. Then the, uh, I owned a brokerage franchise. I sold it to Coal Banker in 2000. And then after that, I did things like, gosh, condominium conversions where you take a multi and turn into condos. The, that went great during a couple of markets. Um, new construction still, rehabs, commercial, mixed use, all of that. Uh, we never did syndications during that, but we touched all those niches. And then after the crash, settled 100% into where we had to play with just the creative real estate. What was it about that crash for you as a real estate investor? <laughs> investor, especially given that you had a you know, decade plus under your belt. What was it about that whole time period that kind of shifted your mindset? Uh, it was <laughs> 23 properties. Again, give you a picture. 23 properties going into the crash of all different stages, developments, commercial, condominium, different stages. Uh, all of those signed on personally. So when the market dove, quick example is Providence, Rhode Island. I had a six unit, I think, or seven unit that was uh, run down. We were rehabbing it and flipping condos out. Two condos sold like hotcakes at like 172. That was the plan, 170. It was like a light switch went off in February of 08. You couldn't give them away for 50, the, the next five or four or five units. Couldn't give them away. So the the banks come knocking. They do what they're supposed to do, right? They come to collect. You're personally signed on it. So that was painful. So that taught us, nope, not doing that again. Unless it's for a personal residence, you can keep the loan value, you know, loan to value low. We just don't use banks anymore coming out of that mess. Did you end up losing everything during that crash? Yeah, we did work. It took me four years, February of 12, uh, sorry, February of eight to February of 12 to like work it out, either foreclosure or workout or loan mod, you know, whatever it had, whatever we had to do. I didn't file. I, I muscled my way through it. It took years, but it took me four years just to get out of my own way and go, okay, 
I, I got to get back in this. What are the what are the new rules going to be, so to speak? Holy cow! So four years to essentially we call it wine slash unwind. What fifteen yeah. years prior of of work? About eighteen. Yeah. 18. Goodness. I mean, mentally, how, how were you able to do that? What were you thinking during that time period? It was, that's why I took four years. I was in my own way. Yeah. It, that was the challenge. And I, and I just said this on another show. So when I looked back, I went, Hmm, there's two similarities here. There was one in 08 and there was one somewhere in the nineties where I went, Oh, that was a hiccup. What happened? I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have someone I can call and go, Hey, Jace, what's up? I just went through this. What would you do next? Tell me what's next. Tell me what's didn't have it. So as soon as after three, three and a half out of the four years, I figured that out. I started calling people and then I went, oh, it's not so bad. I was just in my own way mentally. Just, ah, it must be me. I can't do this. You know? <laughs> so going and seeking a mentor was really what kind of turned some of that needle for you. I mean, where did you start trying to find a mentor? It wasn't just a mentor. There was a, there was a gentleman that was back in the day. He actually was the one that owned that lumber company that I went to and made those deals in the nineties. And I went to him because he had big companies and he was building hundreds of homes. And I went to him for advice. And then uh, online, just through contacts, I, I reached out to various people. They were just quick phone conversations to like jiggle me and wake me up. So fast forward to, you know, post OA 2012, I guess even, which has been kind of the greater part of the last decade, 12 years, you've scaled pretty quickly. Kind of walk us through this new approach that you've taken with real estate. And, and what you're doing now. Yeah. I find, um, on, in hindsight, on accident, I find that a lot of people like me don't want to go out and ask people for money. So this just doesn't fit some people's personality, right? And uh, whether it's syndication or it's a one investor. So there's that. And then there's the people like me that go, well, my credit got beat up or I just never paid attention to it. In my case, I got beat up, but we used to be good back then. So I used all those, what do I do with all these negatives now and said, okay, well, we can buy with owner financing. You don't need a bank. We could buy with lease purchase, don't need a bank or, or much money. And we can buy subject to existing financing because someone else already signed on that loan. So those are the three ways that we buy. And the other thing that was key, and this is for any business, but it happens to be very specific for real estate with me. We were getting paid, if you remember all those things I just talked about over the years, we were getting paid how many times on a deal? Once. You sell a house or a unit, you get paid. You flip a house, you get paid. You wholesale, you get paid. So you get paid once. That was more transactional J-O-B, in my opinion. Nothing against they have good friends making a lot of money in those niches, but it's transactional. So the last rule, so to speak, that we came out of the crash with was we're not getting paid once on these deals. So I designed and we trademark the three payday system, which allows us to get paid kind of like now money when you do a deal, monthly cash flow after the deal starts, and then a cash out with some wealth at the end. So that's a sort of a perfect business model for cash reasons, cash flow reasons. And that's what we designed again, coming out of the crash. I, I get this question a lot and people, people write in just with, you know, some of these creative financing options, particularly in, in seller financing. I mean, walk us through, why would somebody be even willing to do something like that? Yeah. Everyone asks that. Well, I mean, even take my office building. I'm not there today. I'm at my house, but I, I have a building that we target free and clear properties, owner, owner financing free and clear because they're more apt. They want their price. They're, they're in good financial shape, good good avatar to deal with, but they are willing to do a term to get to their price. So my building, I did an owner financing deal, for example, for a 20-year term. We do single families all the time, and here's the punchline. Because they're free and clear, we structure a high price, but we do principal-only monthly payments. Think of that for a, re a recession hedge. So every month, it's all principal going out on the payment on 99% um, of the deals. My building was a little different. We did principal-only for a while, and then we amortized the, the difference. We both got our way. Uh, he was more sophisticated, but most of the uh, people I deal with are, are fine with, hey, give me my number and I'll give you whatever you need for a term and I'll, I'll take principal monthly payments. That's why we do that. Now, why would they? Estate planning reasons, that was his reason. Uh, tax reasons, that was his reason. You know, roll the tax over time. Um, all kinds of personal reasons. Going to divorce, can't sell and show that yet. I've had all kinds of reasons people do it. Keeping in mind, if a third roughly of the properties in the United States are free and clear, roughly, there's a lot of people to talk to there. You don't need many deals. These deals are super lucrative, each deal. Like the three payday system, it ranges between 45 grand and 250 grand per deal all across our community. Those are lucrative deals and they're over time. That's pretty neat. That's interesting. So a third of the properties from data that you've got essentially in this country are, are free and clear? Ballpark. Yep. Wow. Does that yep. include primary residences or is that just commercial or? I think it's a general category. I was actually on the last show and I wrote down, I'm going to check that stat and see if it gets worse or better. But yeah, it's ballpark. <laughs> hey, I mean, I feel like with, you know, we just came out of what, uh, some of the, the lowest interest rate environments we've ever had in, in our, you know, yeah. at least in my lifetime, your lifetime. I mean, several, right? It's, it's, it's crazy. 
And I just figured, hey, probably most people, you know, went and took debt out on, even if they didn't have before, just because it was like cheap money, right? It was like, oh, that's I exactly like two why or I want to see if it, <laughs> yeah, I want to see if it made a dent. It's exactly why I want to check. But to some people, yeah, they probably are like, what's the point? Like, I would just go take all this cash out, then I'd have a payment when I could just collect the cash flow. And in some cases, that's probably all they really care about is that cash, you know, that monthly cash flow anyway, right? Yeah. And there's a big, I don't know what the percentage is, but in that group, let's say that pool of free and clear, there's a percentage of those that are perhaps tired landlords or tired property owners now, meaning age wise, or they just, they're hearing the media scream incorrectly, probably, but they're hearing the media scream about crash and all this because their ratings go up. And then they get panicking, go, ah, do I really want to go through another one after COVID? So they just sell. You know, so there's all kinds of people like that right now that they're phenomenal prospects to talk to. Is seller financing the one that you typically come across the most often? Um, depends because they're, they're two different avatars. This is interesting. So if I talk to John Jones and John is free and clear, I'm going that owner financing route. He's in good shape financially. He's not hurt and he wants a good deal. If I'm talking to John Jones and he has two homes and one's behind or he can't afford the other one now or they're in arrears, it's I'm talking if, if he's not free and clear. I'm talking uh, sub two. I'm going to buy it, keep the loan in his name, and he just wants the relief. So two different advertisers. One's kind of hurt and take my house, whatever it takes. And the other one's like, no, let's make a good deal here and make sure it's lucrative. And do you find from a portfolio standpoint, are you seeing one more, one or more of the other really? I'm going to tell you it's about, it's probably 40% owner financing, 40 uh, sub two, and then 20% lease purchase. Where Interesting. They just don't want to, they don't want to give up the deed, you know, roughly speaking. I have students that do, like all of one because mm -hmm. they prefer it. Like I got a guy in New Hampshire who just left his job after 30 years for the government. And he's done, uh, he's working on a sixth deal, but he's did five deals, all three paydays each over a hundred grand, left his job, set him out of here. And all of those are on a financing. So hmm. it's just where he'd like to live, you know, it's just, so you, you can control which ones you do. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So at this point, you've got this great company, you've got family working with you. Walk us through a little bit of that because, you know, sometimes people can make it work and work really well. And some people have a struggle with family business. I'm just curious to hear yeah. your take on it. Yeah, yeah. No, that's good. Um, so that system I told you about with elite entrepreneurs that we follow, that we, that we learned in 17, it makes it a little bit less personality and whether it's family or not and all that drama that can go along with it and emotions and more about the mission. So in other words, we have a mission. We voted on it. We have values in the company. We voted on it. It's not something I said, here's what we're doing. So there's no like argument when there's a decision to make with our core management team, whether it's family or not, it's, hey, does it line up with the values? Does it make us get closer to the mission? Yes or no. We all voted on it. Does it do it or not? So it takes a little bit of the personality out of it from that standpoint. And then secondly, people say, well, how did you, did you like design it? And they all came in because everybody does something different. And I didn't. It was me. And then I got too busy and asked my son to join me in 14, I think it was. And then in 15, my daughter and son-in-law said, hey, we're bartending right now. And it's an awful lifestyle, even though we're making cash. Can we come in the business? I said, sure. I mean, it's all on deals and there's no free ride. So that it just organically fell into roles. My son loves the buyer side. My son-in-law likes scaling the company. My daughter likes organizing gentlemen. So everyone does something different and it wasn't designed. It was organically fell into place. Interesting. Do you have any advice for people that are considering family business or, you know, fam family dynamics, you know, in the workplace? Yeah. Just like I would any, any advice to any industry, to anyone looking to seek advice. And that is just find someone, us or someone else, right? Just someone in your business or your life that did what you want to do and you matched up with them morally and ethically, go, go pick their brain. Go say, what mistakes did you make? What's working well? Why? You know, like, should I go join a league? Cause Chris said that works for his family, whatever, but find someone who went through it and just don't try to reinvent the wheel. At this point, you got this great business. I mean, what does the future look like for you? You got a target net worth, <laughs> mission, goals, et cetera, down the road that you're trying to hit? Um, I don't have a target net worth because I think that's just a result of we do everything right, right? So I honestly never tracked it like that. But what we do as a company to get there is we obsess over metrics that will help the student stay and stick. Those are things like we track TTFD, time to first deal. Why? If you come in our community and you do a deal quicker than you would have last year, because that stuff is better and, and faster for you, you're not going anywhere and your life just changed. And every time you do a deal, you change three lives, your own, the buyer and the seller, right? It's kind of a win, win, win. So that's our mission to obsess over those. Secondly, on the personal side, it's at my age, it's to create experiences. Like I got two grandkids now, I'm 57. So it's to make enough money to do the things money can't buy, creating experiences and things like that. What are, what are some of those experiments? Typically, we usually get the into this in the, in the rapid fire, which we'll uh, get to here in a second. But I'm just curious what some of those experiences for you are 
specifically with you know the grandkids, family, or whatever that are important, or that that did you have on your bucket list you haven't done yet? Yeah, yeah. It's either to take time uh, when we're in Rhode Island to hit the beach with them, or we built a home, which is a thirty-year goal for us uh, up in the mountains, and now it's that's where I am talking to you today, and that's where we bring them up and just do some really cool things on ten acres. You said that was a thirty-year goal. Yeah. Holy cow. So you set that in your 20s at this, I guess, a long yeah. time ago? Yeah, we used to come up and say, ah, it'd be cool to be there, it'd be cool to be here. So we've talked about it in one shape, form, or fashion, even though, you you know, the crash happened, things happened, we just kept that in mind. Wow. So 30 years, you get something that you had on your list. That's pretty remarkable. I don't know that I've had somebody talk to somebody that's got, you know, a 30 year goal that now they've realized to fruition. That's pretty cool. You just got to get some old cats on and then you'll, you'll get a bunch of. <laughs> hey, I keep getting requests for them, but man, you know, it's a, uh, it's a different ball game, you know, with the, I, with I, computers I got to I'll, social I'll, and... I'll, I'll tell you publicly <laughs> who to grab on your show. He was on my mastermind yesterday. He, because of a podcast, he now owns 10% of our company. He built the largest fitness brand, one of the largest in the world, uh, Peter Taunton. Um, I'll make the intro if you let my staff know, and he'd be a phenomenal guest for you. Yeah, I'd love to have him. Appreciate it. Well, good, Chris. Let's uh, let's wrap up with some rapid fire questions. Sure. What's the uh, most expensive pair of shoes you purchased? Oh, back when I was speaking, when I thought that was important, uh, this would have been early two thousands. Uh, I don't know. It's probably four or five hundred bucks, but I wouldn't do that now. <laughs> it's just not my world. <laughs> do you remember what you bought? They were Italian. I don't know. I honestly don't remember what. what I thought that was. A, I thought that was the thing to do. <laughs> That's awesome. What about the most expensive meal out that you paid for? Uh, probably in the thousand dollar range. I don't, cause we don't mind doing that. That's an experience, right? That, so yeah. I, I like doing that. Yeah. Okay. What about the uh, most expensive car? Probably the one I have now. Uh, it's the new, um, larger size, uh, Rover. Nice. Like one, one eighty, something like that. Did, did you always drive a luxury vehicle? Um, not always. No, I go and stay. I, I personally drive a Jeep. My oh, wife okay. has the, has the truck. She has a yeah, <laughs> yeah nice what's a key lesson you learned from childhood uh, who who you surround you wouldn't know when you're young but who you surround yourself with is is everything everything like i can remember my grandfather saying things to the to this day like encouragement wise so it's who you surround yourself with big time and and i guess walk us through that a little bit i mean when you're learning that lesson in childhood and surrounding I me mean, was there an experience or something from a surrounding standpoint that you kind of clicked for you that yeah that was important yep um, I, there's many like this, but I, so I played hockey my whole life. There was one coach in particular that was always downgrading. And there was one coach in particular that was always uplifting. And it was a totally different experience. Like the empowerment, the conference, when you're young and someone influences you like that, good or bad, they influence you. Right. Mm -hmm. So it, it's so important that for me, it was just a hockey one, but yeah, my grandfather was always encouraging. Uh, you know, instead of saying you can't do that, he'd say things like, well, when, when you, do, when you're on the Bruins or when you do this, I, I want to make sure you give me tickets. Like he'd say stuff like that and like program programming. Yeah. What's the craziest thing you've ever done to earn money? Craziest thing to earn money. That's a good one. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to, I'm going to go back to really young, uh, because it's not crazy, but that, I, I that age it might've been. So I would clean, I literally in elementary school would clean my closet out like junk. I was going to throw out. And I'd walk about a mile up the street at a busy four corner and I'd just sell whatever was in, in a wagon. I'd sell it. And what, Crap. You, what, what was it? Anything? <laughs> yeah. And it, what was in my closet? Books, clothes, anything that was going to get thrown out. And make a couple bucks or what? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. What was your first job? Uh, my first job was dish, uh, in, a, in a kitchen at a restaurant as a, as a dishwasher. You know, you put the stuff to the machine. And uh, we, had a, we had a lie in the age to get, a, to get the job because I wasn't of age to be employed. You remember how much you made? I think the minimum wage then was, I don't know, four or five bucks. I don't know. Go back to, <laughs> I'm talking, you're going way back here. I'm talking, if I was in junior high, you're talking late 70s. Wow. 78. Wow. Has there been a financial habit that you've changed at all as, you've, as your net worth and wealth has grown? Uh, yeah. So I moved to... Um, mortgage wise to, to debt free recently, pointedly. And it's weird because the habit now is how much can we how much can we, how much cash can we get on the balance sheet versus what are we gonna buy or what are we gonna do for the lifestyle? Like it is liberating to do that. And I learned that coming out of the crash. Like I'm not going here again. So yeah, it's to improve your cash position pointedly with a system that will allow you to put money in certain buckets, if you will, at certain accounts, regardless of how much comes in. A hundred dollars or a hundred thousand dollars. And it gets allocated and it's mindless. You don't think about it. And then before you know it, it's it's 
crazy strong. On that note, and I usually ask a lot of our guests this, but since you kind of brought it up and I forgot about it, how do you think about from your standpoint being in your life stage, when you earn a dollar, how does that get allocated in your mind at this point? Is most of it going to cash just from a a conservative standpoint, putting it in, you know, 4%, 5% return right now? Or do you still, hey, this is pointedly going to some other real estate deals, you know, down the road? I don't put money in the market at all. And that's not against someone that's in the stock. Please don't misunderstand. I just don't because it's out of my wheelhouse. Uh, it's either in my own properties, my wife and I, which I love doing and playing with and working on and getting to zero uh, mortgage positions. Um, but then the company, the company at the pace it's growing uh, needs fuel. As a leader, you got to set a vision, you got to provide the fuel and you got to then put the right people there, right? Those are the only three things. That's my role uh, as a chairman and owner. So yeah, it goes into the company or, or real estate. So you, you take any money out of the company, it's going into some piece of real estate. And if not it's staying inside the company. Yep. Awesome. Yep. Now, now at this stage. Yes. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Uh, what's the most fun that you've had with money? Most fun that money has provided. Sure. Well, I can go two. I can go two ways. Creating experiences with travel is cool, right? We Grand Cayman, we've been a whole bunch of times. But I would say that my 30 year goal, my dream that was, is the most fun, uh, right now that I'm in because I was able to do that. It took a long time. I, I, I wish I could do it in five in hindsight, but it took 30. And mm-hmm. it's, it's by far the most fun where, where we are right now. Yeah. That's awesome. What's a closely held belief that you recently, or that you had that you recently changed your mind on? Closely held belief that I changed on? Probably the money one. Um, the, like not recently, like over the last four or five years is fairly recent. Because again, remember I said I shifted from where we got to get or buy or where we got to change in a lifestyle or more, more, more versus, hey, it's really cool to have nothing behind me for debt. Well, why don't we stack up that the cash position? That's a belief issue. That's all mindset. Do you think that came with kind of where you are in your career or do you think you wish you would have had that belief 10, 15, 20 years ago? Yeah, I definitely wish I had it uh, 10 or 15, 20 years ago. And, and I don't blame anyone for it. It's right. It's my responsibility, but I wish I had it then. Yeah. hundred percent. My wife said to me when I turned 50, we were just getting things cranking again. And she said, it took you 50 years to figure this out. Like kidding, <laughs> but it's true. We, you know, you go through, you go through stuff for a reason and it takes time. No, I get that. How do you get ahead in life? I'm going to go back to the surroundings. Um, you know, connecting with a guy like Peter on accident on a podcast and being around him, be able to pick up the phone and call him, man, you might as well, it's like putting gas on stuff. Um, the one I mentioned should be on your show. So it's, it's, it's who you surround yourself with. Like we had a speaker on our uh, last virtual event and how did she say it? She said, do an audit of your connections and exposure. I thought that was such a cool way of saying it. Like do an audit in the new year or the new quarter, the new month, who are, you hang- who are you allowing in your brain? You want fast growth, get the right people around you. Awesome. Chris, you've dropped a lot of great bombs. Is there anything else? Last piece of advice for somebody who's just starting out on their journey? Yeah, I'll give you a simple one, three steps, because this could be anyone, not just real estate, any business. Find a, uh, a, a, a business or a niche in real estate, a niche uh, that you can get behind. Meaning you go, hey, I, you know, Chris said, win, win, win. Maybe that's one for me, or I like land, whatever it is, pick one. Then two, Pick someone that's gone through, they're not brand new, I, and I'm nothing against the, the newer people in mentoring business, but pick someone that has been through some storms, right? Uh, I've been through, unfortunately, some storms. So when they have a storm, because it comes in any business, they, they need to be able to ask someone, right? So then pick that person. But then this is very important. Pick that person or community that you can relate to morally and ethically too, because you probably have people on your show. And I have had people on my show that had some success, but in the journey, screwed up relationships, lost spouse, kids, whatever, right? They've screwed it up, in my opinion. They, they made it financial, but they screwed everything else up. So that might not be someone you can relate to. It might be someone you can relate to, but make sure you're clear. And then third, once you find those two things, put the blinders on for three years, minimum three years, three years, and don't do anything else. Don't get caught up in shiny objects. Stay with that. Grab onto this short tail and stay with it. Uh, that's any business. Awesome. That's Chris with net worth of 15 plus million dollars. Thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks, buddy. I really appreciate the chat. Thanks for listening to the Millionaires Unveiled podcast with Jace Mattinson. For more stories, investment opportunities, and information, check out our website, millionairesunveiled.com. See you next time when you'll hear from another everyday millionaire.